This week on ANN, Canada's new ambassador of religious freedom headlines a prominent event in Washington, D.C. Rescue efforts continue in the wake of a powerful earthquake in China. And former Adventist Church President Jan Paulson reflects on dozens of televised conversations with young people. These stories and more coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, Adventist religious liberty experts say Canada's new office to protect and promote freedom of belief is helping the country become a key voice in support of human rights worldwide. Last week, the director of the office spoke at a religious liberty event sponsored by the Adventist Church in Washington, D.C. Human dignity is at the heart of freedom and belief. That's what Canada's first ambassador of religious freedom said last week at one of Washington, D.C.'s leading religious liberty events. Ambassador Andrew Bennett was speaking to 160 leaders and officials from the diplomatic community in the U.S. Capitol. He pointed out areas of life that are impacted by religious liberty. Freedom to preach it, freedom to engage in missionary activity, freedom to change one's faith, and yes, freedom to hold no religious beliefs. The need for action in defending freedom of religion, as you well know, is urgent. This year's Religious Liberty Dinner brought together ambassadors and representatives from government agencies, faith groups, and advocacy organizations, all coming out to show their support for freedom of belief. The event celebrates religious freedom and honors those around the world who work to protect and promote this human right. Charles C. Haynes was honored for his work protecting First Amendment rights in public schools. Katrina lantos Fett was recognized for defending the universal right of freedom of religion worldwide. The Religious Liberty Dinner was hosted by the Canadian Embassy. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is standing together with Canada to promote freedom of belief. This is a human issue, not a theological issue, and the Government of Canada really wants to work with all of its allies and partners, um, including different uh, faith communities, to um, champion this right and to emphasize it, and we will you know, stand up for any community that's being persecuted in the world and we look forward to all the opportunities of collaboration that we might have. Adventist religious liberty experts say they're impressed by Ambassador Bennett's commitment to protecting religious liberty and grateful that Canada has formalized its support of religious liberty by creating an office to protect freedom of belief worldwide. Emergency workers in China are continuing a massive rescue operation in the country's Sichuan province this week after a strong earthquake hit the region. Local media are reporting that close to 200 people died in the quake. Thousands more lost their homes, and many have yet to receive food, water, and other emergency aid. Poor weather, powerful aftershocks, and roads blocked by landslides have complicated rescue efforts and aid distribution. Adventist humanitarians in the region walk 40 kilometers to access affected communities. Adventist Development and Relief Agency staff said the narrow roads in the region are still damaged or blocked. ADRA is expected to continue to monitor the situation in the coming weeks, assessing needs and providing aid. Adventist writers and producers in Australia are making final edits to the script of a heritage film project set to trace the church's early formation. The film, called Tell the World, will follow key church pioneers such as Ellen and James White as they discover new Bible truths. Producers at Adventist Media Network in New South Wales say they originally planned to create a DVD series, but production has grown into a dramatized, full-length feature film. Producers are working with a team of historians to ensure that the story is accurate. Filming is expected to begin later this year. Church leaders say they hope the film will be a powerful tool for evangelism, impacting community members, and reigniting the faith of Adventists. Adventist youth leaders in Inner America are connecting with young people in a unique way this week. The region's Youth Ministries Department is hosting its first online youth campaign called Win With Jesus. Thousands of young people are watching the virtual event on their smartphones and tablets. The program uses lessons from the lives of Bible characters such as Gideon to demonstrate how faith can overcome challenges. Youth Director Benjamin Carballo says he hopes the program helps young people realize that they too can be victorious in Jesus. Hundreds of young people, a dozen countries, seven years. The series of live, unscripted conversations between former Adventist Church President Jan Paulson and young people is over, but the lessons live on in a new book. 
called Let's Talk, Conversations with Young Adventists About Their Church. The book reflects on the questions and concerns of college students and young professionals worldwide. Every chapter closes with conversation starters meant to bridge the gap between generations of Adventists. Earlier today, ANN anchor Erica Richards sat down with Pastor Paulson to learn more about this book and the Let's Talk television series that inspired it. Thanks so much for joining us, Pastor Paulson. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. What's the most important thing the church can do to engage younger believers? Well, I think that the church needs to, to keep communication open and going with our younger members, our youth, the young adults in our church. A community which doesn't communicate, the people walk away from each other. And I think we need to talk to each other. And I think the church needs to have trust in the younger members of our community, trust enough to give them an opportunity to practice their gifts and skills and talents. You talk in your book about giving young people space to make mistakes. What do you mean by this? Well, look, sometimes those of us who are not so young, we tend to be very, um, we look somewhat judgmentally on the flaws and mistakes that the younger ones uh, display. Look, we were all there once. We all made our share, had our share of mistakes. Growing up means you, you learn from your mistakes and you move on. And I think we just need to recognize the humanity of the young ones in our church and, and give them the kind of space that we needed for ourselves as we grew up. Looking back on your ministry to young people, what lessons do you most hope readers will take away from your book? Well, I think that they will appreciate that the young people in our church, they care deeply, very deeply, care profoundly for the church. They want the church to do well. They want Christ as the Lord of the church to, to, to be appealing and attractive. So they care very much about the church and we need, therefore, to make sure that they are involved in the life of the church. Thanks, Pastor Paulson. Thank you, it's a pleasure. As I was reading through The Great Hope, here's a phrase that caught my attention. Even now he is at work in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, in fierce tornadoes, hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes. In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. Here is why it brings me hope. The calamities and catastrophes are predicted in the Bible and in this book, but they don't bring me hope in itself, but reminds me that the Bible is true and this book is true, and that I can cling on God's promises. And in spite of the troubles and sufferings of this world, there is hope, and that is in Jesus Christ alone. He is my Redeemer, my Savior, and my friend. If you go out in the night and you look up in the heavens and you see all the stars and now with the Hubble telescope seeing billions of stars and people say that there isn't a God in his creation, I have a real problem with that as an engineer because everything in engineering is done with mathematics. One and one is two, it's not 3.5, it's not 1.8, it's all math and God is perfect and math is a perfect science. Welcome back. The May issue of Ministry Magazine has advice on reaching people in the world's biggest cities. We asked Willie Hux for a preview. In the May issue of Ministry, we are focusing on the mission of the church to the cities. 
Worldwide, by some estimates, there are 12 cities with populations that exceed 10 million and a total of 40 cities with populations that exceed 5 million. These cities are filled with people who advocate countless moral philosophies and various worldviews. Facing such a seemingly daunting challenge, how do we go about the task of reaching secularists, atheists, and others who pursue their own version of spirituality outside of scriptures? Can we indeed reach them with the gospel of Christ? Or are we chasing an illusion when we hope to do so? We, the editorial team of ministry, firmly believe that all things are possible with Christ. And to this end, we have assembled a group of writers who address themes of practical ministry to the large cities in the 21st century. As an example, Johnny Wong shares his testimony of an urban-based outreach center that he and others started 10 years ago and has resulted in three churches planted within cities, most of the members from non-Adventist backgrounds and close to a 90% retention rate of baptized members. Indeed, the principles these writers share fit any setting, be it in a large city or small village. But we also believe that true success does not lie in techniques. We recognize that it is not by might nor by power, but by God's spirit that our mission to the cities will be accomplished. We trust you will be blessed as you read the May issue of ministry. The media team from Novo Tempo recently toured historic sites along the U.S. East Coast. They were gathering footage and information to cover the church's 150th anniversary. Before heading up north, though, they covered something a little closer to the Adventist World Church headquarters near Washington, D.C. Larissa Preuss has this report. Simple, small, dressed in a very light shade of pink, almost white. By itself, it could easily go unnoticed. But this rare oriental beauty has the power to attract a multitude, literally, to its feet. It's been four months of cold weather, not much sun, and almost no green to be seen. But as the winter ends, the cherry blossoms appear as a delicate invitation to those who have spent so much time indoors to come out for a new season. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's, it's definitely more crowded than I thought it would be. Uh, but it's definitely a testament to uh, yeah, the beginning of the new spring and, you know, my people say in Japan, uh, you know, when the cherry blossoms bloom, it's, it's the beginning of life and the beginning of uh, spring. The phenomenon that attracts more than one million people this time of the year to Washington, D.C. has a name. Sakura is the Japanese word for cherry blossoms. The 3,000 plus cherry blossom trees planted along the tidal basin were donated to the people of the United States by the people of Japan. The first trees were planted in 1912 by First Lady Ellen Taft and the Viscountess Iwa Chinda, and after all these years, they continue to bloom. Emily lives in Hawaii. Last year, she watched the Cherry Blossom Festival in Japan, and by observing the sakura, she learned not only the word ephemeral, but also the feeling behind its meaning. Well, the Cherry Blossom only lasts two weeks, which is a very short period of time and that kind of makes me sad because its beauty is very very nice in a time where ephemeral and eternal seem to be mixed up the lesson demonstrated by this small flower reminds us that everything comes to pass whether it's the cold winter or the beauty of spring now let's find out what our facebook and twitter followers were talking about this week Megan Bronner has a roundup of Adventist social media highlights. This week's 92nd social media news. The petition to release imprisoned pastor Antonio Montero passed 30,000 signatures this week. But we still need your help reaching our goal of 1 million. Head to prayfortogo.com to sign the petition. This week is World Immunization Week and humanitarian agencies across the globe are working together to prevent 2 to 3 million child deaths every year. The deaths can be easily prevented by most routine childhood vaccinations. To learn how the Adventist Development and Relief Agency is supporting this initiative, visit their Facebook page or the initiative website. You can also give by texting SHOTS to 85944. And if you missed the live tweeting from the International Religious Liberty Association Dinner, you can still catch up with the hashtag Liberty Dinner. Attendees shared their favorite moments and quotes throughout the evening. Did you know the Adventist Church has a ministry for the visually impaired? 
Visit the Christian Record Services for the Blind Facebook page for regular news updates and product information. The Adventist Review tweeted a link to our story of the week. The article, Americans Love the Bible But Don't Read It Much, cited a poll that found Americans have 4.4 Bibles in their homes, but more than half read their Bible maybe four times a year. And in world social media news, Twitter could soon move to a two-step authentication process after the Associated Press account was hacked last week, sending out alarming fake tweets about explosions in the White House. In the meantime, make sure your passwords are secure. Advent stewardship leaders are involving local pastors, lay leaders, and ministerial students as they recast the ministry in a more holistic light. Erika Puni explains. A stewardship consultation provides an opportunity for stewardship leaders to recast stewardship vision, assess past plans and activities, strategize for the future, share resources, and inspire participants to a shared outcomes for the church. This was the experience of Stewardship Ministries directors and invited guests who participated in such a consultation held in Nandi, Fiji in July this year for the South Pacific Administrative Region of the World Adventist Church. In attendance were Stewardship Ministries leaders from the church headquarters in the USA, the regional headquarters in Sydney, Australia, as well as leaders representing the sub-regions of Papua New Guinea, Australia, New Zealand Pacific and Trans-Pacific offices based in Fiji. What made this consultation unique and invaluable was the participation of local mission directors from the Trans-Pacific region, local pastors and lay leaders from the Nandi area, and ministerial students from Fulton Adventist College in Fiji. By opening the consultation to local church leaders and students, the potential for stewardship education is increased in all levels. This benefit cannot be overstated. The more leaders we have who fully understand holistic stewardship, the better the message of holistic stewardship, of course, being the rule of Jesus Christ in the heart. Radio can be an effective way to reach countries where traditional evangelism is difficult. Adventist World Radio recently asked a lay member from Southeast Spain how the radio ministry is impacting North Africa. Carlos, how can we best reach the countries of North Africa close to Spain where you live? What is the best way to get to these people with the message? Todos los medios están disponibles y todos están a nuestro alcance, pero de todos ellos si hubiera que elegir con eficacia sería la radio, porque es el medio que con más intimidad la gente puede escuchar. And how would you do this from Spanish territory to reach Morocco, Algeria and other countries in North Africa? How would, where would you put the radio stations? España tiene territorios en el norte de África, frontera con Marruecos, Ceuta y Melilla y ciudades próximas a distancias muy cortas desde las que se puede alcanzar el territorio marroquí en FM y también físicamente con las personas. There are many people in Morocco that can hear the stations from Spain. Do we have any proof that the message, the signal is getting through to, Mor to Morocco? La radio y la televisión, pero especialmente la radio, llegan con una gran eficacia a todos los territorios norteños, es decir, de, desde la puerta de Dajla, en el sur de Marruecos, hasta Orán, la ciudad que está en Argelia. Todos esos territorios son alcanzados por la radio. Thank you, Carlos, for being here with us and sharing with us today about what, is the, what you're doing in Spain for these countries. Appreciate it. Gracias. Still ahead on ANN, the most convenient ways to share photos online. But up next, a new television show explores overcoming addiction. Every hour of every day, someone, somewhere, is praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Seven, seven, seven. Praying at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., seven days a week. The book, The Great Controversy, is going to have a great impact in Southern Asia Edition, winning more souls for God through our members. 
I am sure through this book, many are going to accept Christ for His kingdom. And may the good Lord bless this endeavor, which we are intent to do very soon. Um, I pray for wisdom from God to do really good in school and to do really good um, in piano and my piano lessons. I pray that all the people that are sick can come, become well and whoever needs food should get food and be happy. Please pray seven in the morning, seven in the evening, and seven days a week. Welcome back. The Adventist Church's television network is launching a new program that tells the stories behind addiction, explores treatment options, and points to Jesus as a source of strength. We asked Hope Channel for a preview. Prescription drug abuse, underage drinking, self-mutilation, overeating, people pleasers. These are all topics covered in Unhooked, a new 26-part series broadcasting on Hope Channel. It's a partnership between Hope Channel, the Health Ministries Department of North America, Adventist Recovery Ministries, and VersaCare. Unhook takes a courageous look at addictions and how they have devastated families and friendships. Former addicts and even those who are still struggling are brave enough to share their testimonies of defeat and relapse. I remember I would sit in the therapist's office and she would say, you have the drug history of a 40-year-old woman. And I'm sitting there 18 years old thinking, I don't have a problem because I'm not legal to drink. Unhooked also provides a rounded perspective on treatment, which addresses the physical, emotional, behavioral, and spiritual components of recovery. Medical and psychological experts encourage viewers to rely on Jesus to help them break the cycles of addiction. How did I get here? This is not the person my mother raised me to be. Something seriously drastic had to change. And that's when the Lord stepped in. You can watch episodes online at hopetv.org slash unhooked. Online photo management tools are making it easier than ever to share photos with a worldwide audience. Andrew King has a rundown of some of the best photo sharing websites on this week's Tech Corner. You've invested money in a good quality camera. You're committed to actually taking photos on a regular basis so you can understand which ones captured the moment and the ones that fell flat. Now you're ready to share these photos that you've put all this time and energy into with other people. What are your options? Now that we have the internet, you can share your photos digitally without the need for physical prints. You don't need your own website to do this. There are many companies that offer these online photo sharing services. Some are free, some require payment. I won't list all of them here, but some of the large established services are Pinterest, Instagram, Flickr, Imager, PhotoBucket, Picasa, ImageJack, TinyPix, Shutterfly, and 500Pix. I could continue, but if you want to just do your own research, search for the term photo sharing website. Most of these services do more or less the same thing, so the exact service is not critical. The most important part in sharing your photo on the internet is what you do after you upload it to one of these services. You need to give each photo a title and describe what is happening in the image. You don't need to tell what is obviously made clear by looking at the photo, but you do need to describe who's pictured, why you took the photo, and what's going on. It's also very important for you to use the word Adventist or Seventh-day Adventist in your description. If you took photos of your church doing something positive in your community, these images will appear when people search for Seventh-day Adventists on the internet, and this will allow people to learn more about who we are and what we do. Maranatha Volunteers International provides urgently needed churches and schools worldwide. This month's Maranatha feature highlights some of the supporting ministry's current projects in the Dominican Republic. After nearly 10 years since last working in the Dominican Republic, Maranatha is returning. Starting this year, volunteers began work in multiple locations. 21 years ago, Maranatha embarked on a significant construction project in the Dominican Republic. Over a period of three months, 1,200 Maranatha volunteers traveled to the capital city of Santo Domingo to build 25 churches. As a result, Adventist membership in the Dominican Republic multiplied at a considerable rate. 
In 2002, Maranatha returned to build more churches at the request of the Adventist church leadership. Now, in 2013, Adventist membership continues to grow, and Maranatha has been asked to build more places of worship. In addition to the Dominican Republic, Maranatha also returned to Panama this year. The Adventist Church in Panama saw a significant growth in membership after Maranatha's efforts in the late 1990s. Most influential were the Maranatha schools. Church membership increased significantly near these educational centers. For this most recent effort, Maranatha will build churches and also multiple schools in Panama. Approximately 400 volunteers are scheduled to work in Panama this year. In 2013, more than 2,000 volunteers will serve the church through Maranatha in 12 countries around the world. Now let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, a milestone in the life of a legendary evangelist. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History, when we commemorate the lives of two servants of humanity. On April 22, 1947, Perry Alfred de Forest died. De Forest, a native Canadian, was born in 1867 and lost his mother at the age of four, living in foster homes until he was 18. At 20, he was converted to Adventism through the influence of his uncle, legendary literature evangelist George A. King. Determined to become a medical missionary, he earned several medical degrees despite no financial support. In 1895, the General Conference sent him to Switzerland as the medical superintendent of our work there. And in Switzerland, he opened the Institut Sanitaire at Basel, the Clinique La Liniere, a sanitarium on the shores of Lake Geneva, and also founded a nursing school and health food factory. On April 24, 1985, HMS Richards died. Richards conducted his first evangelistic campaign while still in his teens and married Mabel Eastman in 1920. After years of leading campaigns in the major cities of California, Richards began a radio broadcast in Los Angeles in 1930. In 1937, it expanded and became the voice of prophecy. It was a great success and soon expanded around the world. Hundreds of Adventist ministers introduced voice of prophecy in their country and languages and converted many thousands to Adventism through that radio ministry. Richards is not only one of Adventist history's greatest evangelists, but probably one of the greatest evangelists in modern Christian history. That was This Week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the meantime, follow us on Twitter. You can connect with other Adventists worldwide and join in our weekly social media conversations. Just search for Adventist News on Twitter.com. Our good news for this week comes from the Old Testament book of Job. The passage says, If you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hands toward Him, your life would be brighter than noonday. Though you were dark, you would be like the morning. That's our program for this week, and remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.